Welcome back. We will now look at part two of the chapter on developing strategic performance management systems. Okay, previously, we looked at the link between strategy and performance, financial and non-financial performance indicators, and the different models that's been designed to facilitate the process of developing financial or uh, performance management systems. We are now going to look at, in this session, we're going to look at benchmarking, the different types of benchmarking, advantages and disadvantages of implementing benchmarking, divisional performance management, how do we communicate our performance uh, management system, and then finally, integrated reporting as a means of communicating performance to the different stakeholders. So we'll start off with benchmarking. Benchmarking follows a similar process to performance management, but it's important to understand the difference. And the difference lie in the aim of benchmarking compared, the aim or the purpose of benchmarking compared to performance management. So performance management, the aim is to measure actual performance of the implementation of a specific process or strategy. Whereas benchmarking, the aim is improvement of a specific process or strategy. And you will still measure performance compared to a another division organization's performance, but the aim is to see where the company needs to improve. So there are different types of benchmarking. The first one is internal benchmarking, and that is where you compare one department with another department to see how the one department could improve. For example, if you have um, three different pick and pay shops, you would benchmark stock levels, um, sales, customer service from one sh um, shop to another one to see in which areas a shop could improve or should improve. And then to learn from the shop that has best practices in place of how um, things could be implemented. I am typically with internal benchmarking is to conform processes within an organization. But it is unlikely to bring innovation because you're not doing something different. You're just standardizing existing good practices. The second type of benchmarking is then the competitor benchmarking. And I think this is the one that we often think of when we talk about benchmarking is the one where I compare my performance to that of competitors. Okay, and it is, um, who do you use? You would typically use a direct competitor. It would typically be, it is relevant for the market and the industry in which the organization operates. The problem, however, with competitor benchmarking is the fact that information is not freely available. So you could use comparing financial statements, but you actually get very little from that. And typically, these type of competitor benchmarking are industry driven. So we've been previously in, um, also talking about the hotel industry, and this is actually an example of an industry that use benchmarking. And how the benchmarking works is that they will employ an independent agency that do the benchmarking exercises between different, uh, between different hotels. So I had a friend that was involved in this type of um, evaluation. So what they would do is they would get um, guests and they pay these people to actually visit different types of hotels. And then after they visit, they require to complete um, the benchmarking form. And after you have completed the form, you also need to write a report on the performance 
of the hotel that you have visited. So typically, these benchmark reports are then sent to the different hotels that took part in the benchmarking. And then what they would do is you will see your hotel's performance against um, the competitors, but they will not specifically give the names of the competitors. We only say Hotel A, Hotel B, Hotel C. And so that is an example of competitor analysis and how it actually works in practice. So the third one is process benchmarking. And this is where you would um, focus on a specific process that you want to improve in your organization. So say your company um, has a logistics department but that department is not performing well. You would actually look at a company that has best practices in logistics. It is not necessarily a competitor, or it's normally not a competitor, but it is a company that is known for having best practices, say, in logistics. And you would then um, perform a benchmarking exercise with the aim to innovate and to improve your current practice on that specific process. The problem, however, with process benchmarking is that it takes time and it is expensive. And it's often hard to get another company that is willing to commit to actually being involved in this benchmarking exercise. So for your uh, preparation, it's important that you know the different types of benchmarking um, how they are used, why they are used, and it is typically asked, benchmarking could be as normally asked as um, OTQ questions. So these are the steps um, that you need to take to implement benchmarking, and you also need to know these um, steps. So the first thing is identify what is wrong and what it is that you want to improve. Based on that, you will determine what type of benchmarking you will use. You identify the best practice organization or division or competitor that you want to benchmark against. And then you contract for the benchmarking, you prepare for and you prepare for the site visits. And then you gather information, you evaluate, and then you com um, communicate the results. As I said earlier, there's a difference between benchmarking and performance management, where benchmarking is performance improvement and um, performance management is measurement. So typically, as a result of the benchmarking exercise, the measures that's being used will then form part of the performance management system. So typically from the benchmarking design a performance management system that has similar measures um, included than those that were used in the benchmarking exercise. So what is needed for successful benchmarking? Firstly, you need key executive commitment. So there must be commitment from the top. You need a team of experts um, and to ensure that you have a range of opinions on the feedback that is obtained. You need a team to manage the benchmarking process, a specific team for site visits, specific budget allocation and training, and then a formalized process. Benchmarking works best if it is part of a process uh, that has specific objectives and outcomes. So what are the problems with benchmarking? Firstly, it is very hard to find companies um, that is willing to actually share their the time and the information with, um, company, with other companies. There's no benefit for them um, doing that. Then uncertainty about what is actually best practice. And then thirdly, it, it could be very costly and it provides a rest retrospective view. And once again, it doesn't um, may not necessarily give you um, innovation and it may result in some demotivation um, where employees may feel that they would never reach 
the standard that is set by the best practice organizations. Next, we're going to look at divisional performance measures. And these divisional performance measures are best suited, suited to companies that have a multitude of divisions that they need to compare performance um, against and where it is important that the different divisions work together to achieve um, overall shareholder value uh, and that they are goal congruence. Okay, so the first two measures are um, financial measures and the triple bottom line, the combination of financial and non-financial measures. So both the EVA and the shareholder value analysis are value-based performance management systems. Economic value added or EVA was developed by Joel Stern and is implemented by his company Stern and Stewart. Um, and the Joel Stern developed the EVA based on his, um, or as part of his PhD studies that he did at MIT. And the aim of the study was to develop a performance management or performance measure that is aligned to an organization's um, objective of maximize, maximizing shareholder value. So the EVA is an adapted residual income calculation or measure. Okay, so let's first just look at what residual income is. And you have encountered residual income in your, um, in your undergraduate study. But just to recap, the residual income measures the excess return that the organization have generated above what is required by the shareholders. So it is similar to a return on investment, but with, with um, residual income, the answer is not a percentage, it is an absolute um, value. So it would be an absolute rand or dollar value. And how do you calculate it? You take the net profit of the organization less the required return, and how do you know what is the required return of investors? You will say, what is the investment in assets times the required return? So if it's 14%, 15%, and typically what companies use would be the cost of capital. And if um, the net profit is higher than the required rate of the return, the company has generated residual income. And if it is less, the company has not generated profit that um, is, or the profit that is generated is lower than the required rate of return of investors. Okay, so as I said, EVA is similar to that, but it is an adapted calculation. And you will notice here that EVA has a trademark, which means that whatever the adjustments are, the specifics are not known to the um, to the general public. I have, however, had the privilege of attending one of Joel Stern's um, sessions where he explained the EVA. And based on, um, on his explanations, we have a very good idea of what the type, what the adjustments are that, um, that is made to calculate the economic value added. So firstly, you would start off with the net profit or you would calculate the economic profit, which is the divisional profit, or the divisional net profit that you would get from your income statement. And then because value is the present value of future cash flows, you're trying to adjust that economic profit for all the non-cash items that are included. So when you calculate the profit, it's very similar to the adjustments that you would make to a cash flow statement um, or to calculate a cash flow statement or when you do a valuation. So notice the link between EVA and value or shareholder value. So what is value? It's the, net, it's the present value of future cash flows. So what we, economic pro, profit is then the cash flow profit. And it is a combination of the divisional net profit less non, so you eliminate the non-cash items, 
And also, this is additional, some expenses that has long-term value. For example, research and development, advertising, um, training. It's those things where we discuss the disadvantages of financial measures, where we said over the, um, if managers want to manipulate short-term profits, they will try and reduce those um, expenses. It's typically, those things are, that are also excluded. So just to recap, economic profit is divisional profit, less non-cash items and expenses that have long-term implications. And then similar to the residual income calculation, you would calculate a required rate of return, which is the revalued a revalued asset value um, that is adjusted for the long-term expenses is added to, um, to the revalued assets. And then you calculate um, times the cost of capital or the required rate of return. And then you get an adjusted required rate of return, comparing that to the economic profit. And if um, the answer is positive, you would have cre created economic value. And if it is um, negative, you would have destroyed economic value in your organization. So over the long term, the theory states that if EVA is positive, it would, it would help the, or it would translate in long term shareholder value for the organization. So for um, exam purposes, the, the calculation of EVA is typically asked um, in OTQs, and it is a very simple type of calculation. And if you understand this, um, it is good enough for exam purposes. And so the second um, value-based measure is shareholder value analysis. And it consists of two types of ratios. The first one is the total shareholder return, which is the, as a percentage, the growth in share price plus dividends over the share price in the previous year. So it is actually the percentage of value that the um, that an investor would have earned on um, by investing in the company. And the second one is the shareholder value, which is what I stated earlier, the present value of the future cash flows discounted at the cost of capital, and then less the market value of the debt, and this is shareholder value. It's a valuation calculation. So according to Rappaport, and it's important that you know these seven um, things, if you want to create long-term shareholder value, companies should um, have performance management or measures that focus on sales growth. Because if you increase, if you want to increase shareholder value, what are the three? There are three things that you can really do. You can increase cash inflows, decrease cash outflows, and lower the risk. In other words, lower the, um, the cost of capital. And by doing that, you would. Um, generate shareholder value and really all these seven things has to do with the valuation calculation. So firstly, increasing inflows, um, extending the life of the project, okay, or of your project, because the longer the project, the higher the value. Think of a valuation calculation. If you have a perpetuity, the returns are higher. So increase in operating margin. So that is decreasing expenses, operating expenses, reducing or having an optimum working capital structure, having an optimum capital structure, which would result in a reduction of your cost of capital. And then having um, cautious, cautious asset investments, because if you invest in assets, it has a large impact on the cash flows in that current year. So what it says is that you only invest in 
assets that would generate a positive NPV. And then taxation should also be reduced as a means of reducing cash outflows. And you can use this acronym here, SLOWCAT, to remember the different um, things included in Rappaport. I've asked previously, I've asked Rappaport as either um, part of case scenario based questions and as uh, OTQs. And for me, once again, why do I like this? These shareholder based values, because it, it shows the link between strategy and finance. Um, and you're going to be finance professionals. So it's very important for you that you understand how strategy relates to financial performance. So once again, because your, um, the outcomes state that you need to um, be able to evaluate different performance management performance measures or performance management systems, it's important that you know the advantages and drawbacks of the shareholder based um, measures. I'm not going to go through it, you can just study um, each one of these. And then the third type of um, stakeholder based management system or measure would be the triple bottom line and it's part of the, um, uh, it's Alkington has developed this and it's also included, it's been included in the King reports and it formed the basis of integrated reporting as well. We, um, it is stated that there are three areas that should be measured. So for a company to be a sustainable company, it should focus on the people, on its people, um, the planet and profits. So this is the social side, this is the environmental side, but also the profit side. Okay, and just these things you will see, they have an equal bearing. But unfortunately, if, they, if a company is not profitable, they cannot look out for the people and the planet. But they cannot run, it is unethical for a company to, run, to be run or to prioritize profit before people and before planet. But again, you cannot without profit look after the people and look after the, um, the planet. And that is really also what was tested in assessment opportunity for. So that if there are no profits, if the company is in liquidation, it cannot look after communities and employees and it cannot look after um, the planet. So advantages of the, um, the uh, triple bottom line, it is if you, if you use this and you incorporate this as performance um, measures, you attract ethical aware customers. Okay, so customers who are concerned about the environment, who are concerned about the reputation of the organization will not buy from companies who are unethical in terms of how they handle people and how they handle the planet. Okay, you would also attract better quality staff. The staff members do want to work for a company that adds value, that is socially responsible. And then also um, there's actually research that has shown that companies who are more environmentally and socially responsible have um, reduced costs because of the fact that you have um, savings on electricity, um, cleanups, reduced pollution, um, better relationship with, um, with your staff and your customers. And you also have a reduced chance of legal action. And the disadvantages, it's often difficult to quantify and all companies have different ways of measuring the um, social and environmental investment. And because of this, um, because of the, the perception that to be um, socially and environmentally responsible, um, that it has an, a negative impact on profitability, there are often management conflict between the objectives. So should we um, increase profitability over being environmentally responsible or socially responsible?
So the third thing that we're going to look at today is how do we communicate um, performance measurement? And firstly, what do we communicate? So the first thing, what do we communicate? We communicate the targets and how we're going to measure it. You explain why specific targets were selected. And thirdly, how by achieving the specific targets or objectives, you personally will benefit and the company would also benefit. Or how, the, how you or the company would not benefit if the targets are not achieved. So why is it important to communicate this? Because firstly, if employees understand the performance um, management, that would typically be more committed to the performance. It also increases the ability to achieve the objective because if you're committed and you understand what you need to do, employees generally um, have a better chance of achieving the objectives. And you also understand the impact of either achieving or not achieving the targets. And by discussing specific measures, the organization will also get feedback on the achievability of targets because often managers think that something is achievable, but um, the people who actually work with um, customers know that some targets may either be achievable or not achievable. And performance um, measurement could therefore also be more realistic. realistic. Within communication, there's a whole concept in, and also in management accounting of setting stretch targets. So a stretch target is something that is achievable, but it is not easy to actually attain those targets. Um, and often management like to set stretch targets. Personally, I am not a fan of that because of the fact that people are often demotivated because even if you set a stretch target, it is in 99% of the cases not achievable. So why set something that is not achievable where people think I am really not going to achieve it? And also often the cost of achieving that objective um, out, does a, a, your, the cost for you personally is more than the benefit that you would get. And there are also questions around the ethics of these targets because often um, to achieve them, uh, employees may um, conduct unethical behavior. So if you want to have achievable, or if you want to set stretch targets, there must be significant awards. So um, pay increases, significant bonuses from uh, the possibility of promotion or more responsibility. Could be things that um, would help people achieve stretch targets. But also on this, I also think some um, stretch targets suit certain personality types better than others. So if you have an A-type personality and people who are very task orientated, they actually thrive in environments where they have stretch targets. But where if you have a more, uh, say, a people orientated person um, that is not motivated by achievement so much, it is not a good idea to set stretch targets because they would typically just be um, demotivated by those things. Okay, so yeah, this section I think is very important because this again would help you to answer a question where you are required to evaluate a specific performance management system and recommend alternatives. So the problems with performance measurement systems it generally revolves around how controllable are the measure, how fair is the measure, does it result in goal congruence for the company as a whole, um, and that is typically the things that you can expect in, um, in a question like that. 
So with complex um, organizations, the issues are typically, as I said, goal congruence. Um, and it's similar to how do you actually coordinate, especially if you have very diverse um, strategic business units, how do you coordinate the different businesses to achieve the overall corporate objectives? And then um, what is the implications of the performance of one unit is dependent on that of another. So you're achieving your targets, but because your um, another division or company does not achieve their targets, it, impacting you negatively and then very often this is a major major thing with performance management is this treatment of head office cost so typically if you have a head office with strategic business units the cost of that head office is allocated to the strategic business units and often um, so firstly, the issue is controllability. I cannot control that cost, but I have to cover it through my business operations. How fair is that allocation? On what basis were that fixed overheads allocated? And is it fair? So if you have a centralized HR department, for example, typically what they would do if you employing a new person in your division, they would charge you a placement fee. And then um, that placement fee is often higher than what you would have charged by an outside company to achieve, um, to perform that function. And that creates a lot of um, negativity and um, negative staff morale around that. And then also transfer pricing because of, so transfer pricing, often you have transfer prices that is not set at a market value because of tax purposes or any other purpose. And that may also um, negatively impact um, the performance of the division, especially when it is based on, when it's a profit center and your uh, performance measures are based on profitability. And as I said, other problems with performance, the, um, the previous slide dealt with performance measures in, um, in a complex structure. But in all organizations, things such as how, what control do I have over the measure? Because if I cannot control profitability or expenses, but I'm measured on it, people become extremely negative. And then the fact of um, sub-optimization. And sub-optimization is with... Um, I'm looking out for my own best interest, but that is not necessarily the best interest for the company as a whole. And because of that, you have sub-optimization. Um, okay, and overall, as I said, short-termism, the thing that wrong signals are sent out, um, and target selected does not result in value maximization. When we look at, so if you have a divisional company, you may have different types of divisions. The first one is a cost center. So that would say be something like a marketing department. A marketing department only incurs cost. They don't earn revenue. So what you would look at the um, typical measures included for a cost center would be what is my total cost compared to the budget? What is my cost per unit? So say you have a training department. Once again, a training department it doesn't earn, ex if, if you don't offer external training, only internally. What is the cost per person that you've trained? What is the quality of the work that you've performed? Um, how productive were you in um, using the resources that were allocated? And how efficient have you used those resources? A profit center, that is a, a, a strategic business unit that, in, that has both um, profits, uh, income and costs. But certain things, um, so you, you really just have an income statement. And you typically in this case, you would have um, allocation of overheads. So that division is only responsible for selling the goods and it typically would be say a pick and buy that you have um, 
as a strategic business unit. So that unit is responsible for its own profits. So you'd look at things like sales, margins, the profitability, your investment in inventory, your working capital, what is your customer satisfaction. And the final type of strategic business unit that you could get is an investment center. And that is where that company operates totally independent from, um, from your parent company. Um, and there you would use a full set of financial, non-financial measure, measures with re return on investment and um, or, or a combination of shareholder-based performance management. So an uh, investment center is treated as a company on its own. So here are the, th are the things that you have to watch out for. And this is really a summary of all the problems of um, performance management. So the first one is that there could be misrepresentation. So people can manipulate or misrepresent information to increase the division or personal performance me um, measures. Gaming. Um, what I've said earlier about companies trying to um, not have outliers, but have a steady increase in, um, in profits. And you, so you therefore do not have, because you, you're managing your own interests, you're not giving a fair reflection of what is happening. And also you don't want high profits this year because next year, you even expected to have more. So I know with my husband's company, they had a budget session earlier this year while we were on full lockdown. And with them, I was actually laughing. They have this, um, the fake budget. I won't say what the real name for that was, but uh, um, the BS budget and the actual budget. So the BS budget is sent to head office. Um, and that is what the performance is measured on, but then the actual budget is what they internally, as their division, is trying to achieve with stretch targets, etc. So that is an example of gaming. And then misinterpretation. So um, different people or different managers could interpret different measures differently or incorrectly, and that has a result that may impact. Um, actual performance. And then short-termism, where you focus on the short-term, we've spoken about that a lot. Uh, measure fixation, so you only focus on the measures. And that's typically the case where you use financial measures. So I'm only focusing on this and then I'm neglecting the other things. And it's similar to tunnel vision. We only have this and it, you don't consider all aspects. Suboptimization is, um, we, it's, um, not achieving the objectives of the organization as a whole, and ossification, which relates to the unwillingness of people to change. So you use performance management to actually just keep the status quo. So the final section that we're going to look at is integrated um, reporting. And as stated previously, it relates to how do we report to all our um, stakeholders. The, so we report the performance of the company um, to all stakeholders. And within integrated reporting, management accountants play a very important role in actually generating this information because with an integrated report, the aim is to give a balanced view, including both qualitative and quantitative information. And the aim is for the company to communicate the ability to create value over the short, medium, and long term. And what you're trying to do is link past performance to your present performance and explain how it will impact your future performance. Um, you also need to um, consider the impact of the external environment and it, consider, um, and it considers the optimum allocation of resources through your discussion of your business model. Um, and um, it's tailored to specific businesses. And um, the main 
criticism of integrated reports is that it is too long and it contains too much information. So the challenge, challenge lies in reporting everything that you have to, but it should remain concise. Um, a student of mine, a master's student, have actually done some research on the skills required by integrated reporting. And um, a study found that management accountants, the profession is actually best uh, preparing students to perform the functions of integrated reporting. So as I said previously, each company at this stage can decide how they want to prepare their integrated report. So the, um, integrate, the International Integrated Reporting Council, that is the IIRC, has ever created an integrated reporting framework, the IR framework. And that IR framework has provided some guiding principles. But the challenge at the moment is that those principles are not enforceable. And um, so within the EU companies, the um, Europe um, and African companies, they typically follow the, um, the guidelines of um, the IIRC, but the American companies basically um, they're not so much into integrated reporting, but they've adopted the GR, um, the Global Reporting Initiative, the, those principles. And we will discuss that also just in a few minutes. Um, so um, what are the guiding principles? Is that in your, your integrated report should have strategic focus and future on it, orientation information should be connected. So information on your capitals, information on your financial and non-financial information should be connected. It should consider stakeholder relationships. It must have materiality. It should con only consider material um, issues, should be concise, should be re reliable and complete. Can you see the problem? with these things is that it to actually have something that only addresses material aspects that is concise but is reliable and complete um, it poses a challenge and then it must be consistent and it should give comparable um, information as stated in the previous um, set of um, slides is that if you want to measure performance, you need to compare it against something. But because if you just say this is what I've achieved without comparing it against the prior year, a standard or whatever, it really doesn't provide enough information. Okay, so what are the content elements? And these content elements you just need to study. These are the things, and this would typically be the headings that you will find in an integrated report. So the organizational overview and the ecosystem or the external environment. What are the key risks and the opportunities that are faced? What is the strategy of the organization? How are we allocating resources? This is then translated into the business model, which is how do we actually create inputs, have a process and an output. And in my mind, a business model is really just an understanding of how do we make money? How are we, what is the fundamentals of how we, how we do business, how we make money? Um, and if you understand this, you would under, also understand what the key ratios are that you need to look at for that specific company. What are the future outlook? And it's linked to the strategy. Um, what are our current performance? And as I said, it's the past performance, the present performance, and the future performance. What are, um, what are our governance structures? And um, on what basis did we prepare um, and present the information? So was it based on the, IR, um, on the IR framework or did the company use um, um, the the G4 prints or the um, Global um, Reporting Initiative Standards. Okay, so the six capitals um, of integrated reporting says that these are the stakeholders that should be addressed in your integrated report or should be focused on. And the first one is your financial capital. And generally, um, 
companies don't have a problem with that because in the past your normal financial reports focus on the financial capital but in the reporting side you need to also provide your key um, measures and ratios manufactured capital is your inventory your um, um, the plant if you're a, ma a manufacturer but it is what do you actually manufacture what do you make the intellectual capital that deals with um, with your staff and your HR. Um, oh, sorry, not not so much. The intellectual capital is your trademarks, your patents. Um, what what is the innovation that you have in your organisation? Um, human capital is the human capital. Is the staff, the training, the welfare. How do you treat your staff? Social and relational ship capital, those are all your external, your other external stakeholders, such as the, the society in which you operate, um, the relationships that you have with your stakeholders, your um, suppliers and your customers. And then finally, the natural capital, and that is um, the environment. How do we, how as a company, do are we responsible and sustainable in terms of the natural capital that we use? Okay, so um, perhaps just on the integrated reporting, it is important that you know the guiding principles, the content elements, and the six capitals, and have an idea of what they are. Um, CIMA do ask, have asked um, in the past some stuff on integrated reporting, um, and that you need to comment on how the company should prepare an integrated report. So it is, but if you if you know the guiding principles, the content elements, and the six capitals, you should be fine to answer those type of questions. And then the last um, thing, as I said, so um, it's the glo um, the global reporting initiative, and um, the global reporting initiative um, basically said that um, if you have what should be included in your integrated report? And what should companies be reporting on? So your report content should be stakeholder inclusive. It should have sustainability context. It must be material, it should only address material things and it must be complete. The quality should have a balance, should be comparable, should be accurate, um, must be timely, must be clear and reliable. And then the standard, um, the general standard of disclosure, you have to have strategy and analysis, you need to give an organizational profile, um, identify the material aspects, the boundaries of the organization. Um, what is our stakeholder engagement? The report profile, governance, ethics, and integrity. And you will see it's very similar to the IR framework, the things, type of things that are addressed. Um, stated previously, the European countries prefer um, the IR framework where the American companies prefer the um, or is more supportive of the global reporting initiative and those um, guidelines and specific things that should be um, disclosed disclosures on the management approach that is followed and specific performance indicators and um, specific um, categories that should be addressed according to the um, global reporting initiatives and the G4 guidelines is economic, environmental, social, your labor and your workforce, your human rights and your society. Um, and you can see um, you can you can you can see the similarities. So really in the end integrated reporting is that when you produce a report it is not only about the financial performance, but it does indicate reporting to all your stakeholders. I'm just, in my mind, I'm just concerned that companies are spending so much money on doing this, and I don't know whether stakeholders um, are actually reading this, even your shareholders. Um, um, a study that one of my other master's students have um, done recently is just that even with this information that is available, the main thing that still drive um, investment decisions are the financial things. But perhaps it will take time um, for 
investors to get used to um, to the integrated reporting and how they should actually be using this information. But okay, guys, um, this is this on um, what is expected on chapter nine. It is actually quite a long chapter, and that's why I've done it in two sections. Just to recap on what we have done um, in this session, we firstly focused on the benchmarking and the types um, of benchmarking that you can get the advantages and the disadvantages of benchmarking and the, the steps um, required for benchmarking. Then we looked at um, the divisional performance measures and these things are linked to the other performance measures. So um, shareholder based measures can be included in these models as well. So in your balance scorecard under um, um, under, under the financial perspective, you could include shareholder value analysis, EVA, and in your other um, perspectives, your internal processes, customer perspectives, um, learning and growth, aspects relating to the triple bottom line could also be included in there. Um, we then looked at the communication of your performance management, setting stretch targets, and finally, the eight content elements. Oh, the, the integrated reporting, which is the, as I said, the the guiding principles, the eight content elements, the capitals, and then the GRI guidelines that you should be familiar with. Okay, so on that note, um, we are done with this year's work. Please. Um, for this final chapter, I think it's very important that you actually study this because you will have long questions, scenario-based questions in both the final assessment and um, the supplementary assessment opportunities that will focus on this chapter because it hasn't been tested yet. So a significant um, number or amount of marks your scenario-based question will be based on chapter nine.